Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, so before we start, uh, I would like to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, first, who wasn't at the keynote on Tuesday? Wasn't. <laughs> wasn't, OK. That's good. So uh, the reason why I'm asking is uh, this presentation is about, so you've seen uh, the, the live coding session on Tuesday. Um, really, what, what we wanted to show you is how Spring Boot improved the developer experience. So what we do, uh, what we try to improve in every boot release to help you being more productive. And this session is actually a follow-up to that. So in this session, uh, don't worry, we won't redo the uh, keynote demonstration. It's actually a completely different app with different, um, well, related and also different uh, demos. Uh, but we have a chance now with a 60 minute slot to go deeper and explain in more details what we couldn't do during the keynote. Yeah. And uh, as well, d don't worry, everything we're doing right now, it's uh, on a repository on GitHub in the Spring One platform uh, organization on GitHub. And all the commits are uh, crafted with love, so it's all explained. You'll see everything we're doing, you, you'll, you'll see it. Uh, so don't worry, uh, and just sit back and enjoy, and, and don't hesitate to ask questions during the presentation. Yeah, we have time, so do not hesitate to interrupt us. So um, who's using Spring Boot already? That's 50%. OK. So uh, before we start, uh, this is live coding demo. We'll have plenty of slides first, very boring. So this is it. <laughs> um, OK, so I have an app. Um, we have an app. Uh, it's a call for paper, sample application. So uh, the first thing we are going to do is to show you what that basic application does. So there is this home page. You can see some GitHub integration there. Um, you can actually submit a talk to the CFP. OK, so you enter some data and yeah, whatever. And you submit. Well, you get some validation error. Um, then, OK, summary, submit, then, OK, your talk has been submitted to the system. I can also see in the admin section, remember that, because we'll go back uh, several times there. Uh, there's an admin section. You can see if I'm trying to, to access that, I need to log in. So I'm giving you the uh, user password now, admin, admin123. <laughs> Very clever. And I have this page where I can see the submitted proposals. Because I'm using DevTools, and we'll go back to that in a minute, uh, al al almost I get, sorry, automatically a, uh, sorry, that's the other one. I automatically get this nice H2 console feature. So I'm using, currently we're using H2, so it's an in-memory database. I will change that. Uh, so every time the application starts, uh, we create the schema. Hibernate creates the schema automatically for us, and then we can have access to, uh, to, the, to the data that way. So this is really our development environment. Um, if we look maybe at the code now. Yeah. I, I think we also uh, need to show you that uh, we are fetching some data from GitHub. And uh, because the GitHub API is rate limited, so if you make too many requests and you don't have any authentication with GitHub at some point, GitHub will say just stop and will stop responding. So uh, for that, we have for now a, a GitHub token with a, an environment variable. So we're not really happy about this. We'll yeah, figure don't do this that. out during, <laughs> during our talk. But just to let you know, we're uh, not stuck with GitHub because we, we have a token right now to issue our, our uh, requests against the API. So if you don't specify a token when you uh, call the GitHub API, you have a 60, 60 uh, invocation per minute per hour, sorry, rate limit. So you can make up to 60 calls to the GitHub API per hour, which is really not a lot. So what I've, did, what I've done is I registered um, an application token, um, and then I'm injecting that as an environment variable. So it's using add value for now. It's bad, don't do it. We will fix it. Uh, the other thing that we have in this application is basic security configuration, where you can see, OK, all kinds of um, uh, While well, the admin section, you need to have to have the admin role, and we are making the, all the static resources of our application public, so you don't need to be authenticated to to see those. And uh, same thing for the news page, where you, we see the latest commits uh, on the Spring Framework and on Spring Boot. And we also made the submit page public, 
but we may change that in the future. And we also have our login page, which is a thing that you've seen. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So if you look at this application, this Spring Boot application, uh, besides the security config, there is really not much, really. Um, if you look also at static assets down there, so you have all the templates that's using Mustache. We're using Mustache, right? Uh, ah, no, uh, time leaf. Time leaf, sorry. We're using time leaf, yeah. And so that's for the templates directory right there. And the static directory is a common location for static assets. So whenever you drop a file there, uh, we will serve it. So you can serve very easily CSS, images, and whatnot. And Spring Boot also supports WebJar. Um, and it does that automatically for us. Now we're going to try to make that application a bit better. And uh, since we have DevTools, uh, the, whole, the whole experience is, uh, is much, much easier. And you'll see how. So um, the first thing we need to do is to enable that library load thing. Uh, that's what I've done at the keynote. So maybe a, a bit of words about that. So library load, library load server and client, uh, we're not actually doing that. It's a third party uh, company uh, um, um, building that product. But the nice thing about it is the specification between the server and the client is open source. And the client, uh, they provide that browser plugin. They do so for Chrome, uh, Firefox, Firefox, Internet everything. Explorer, and whatnot. So you can install that for free in the browser that you're using. Uh, what we've done is we implemented a very, very, very basic library load server. Uh, so when you start an app with DevTools, it will also fire up a library load server. And that's the reason why I'm able to commit, uh, to connect, sorry, uh, to the application. So, yeah. so, so that library load server is actually a way from, for DevTools it's uh, the first step for DevTools. It's actually a way for DevTools to send a signal to your browser or your plugin here uh, whenever something changed in your application so that you don't have to change something in your app, then go back to your browser, and then refresh. With that live reload signal, whenever something changes, uh, the browser is made aware of that, and it's reloading the page as soon as it happens. So that's one, one thing you don't have to do during, during development. Uh, it's refreshing all the time. So you get that signal. But how Spring Boot is um, guessing when to send that signal, we'll, we'll see, about, uh, see about that when we make changes to, to the application. So first thing about this app is um, we lack of inspiration there. It's some text here probably should be changed. So let's have some kind of very nice, uh, I don't know, slogan. Share your patient. That's very nice. So recompiling the application, doing something on Spring Boot, and then sending a signal and refreshing your browser. So that's one for another first step as well for, for DevTools. DevTools is uh, automatically uh, configuring defaults for your application in development mode. So here, for example, it's, uh, it's uh, configuring Timeleaf not to cache templates in development. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to restart your application because the, the, the templates are compiled and cached. So here, they're not, so you can uh, you can refresh the application and uh, you, you see the, the changes on, on your page. And same thing for the static sources. By default, uh, DevTools will uh, tell the, your browser that it shouldn't cache the, those resources because you're, you're probably changing those a, a lot during development. So that's not very smart, per se, because I mean, if you change a static asset and you disable the cache, you could do that yourself. I mean, you have some code, you have some configuration to write but it's not really super smart, right? Because you change some file, you disable the cache, so if you hit the page again because the cache, as, as in the template, it will be read again, and you'll get that um, reflected aut automatically. But DevTools does more, and uh, we can see here that there is a track missing for our CFP, and there is a code here that represents the track, so I'm going to add one. I'm going to add a web track. So I'm changing Java code, basically, and if I do that, um, I have the web track right there now. So what happens here is that um, DevTools is also uh, adding a file watcher on your application. So whenever something, uh, a file has been modified by you uh, in your application, so static resources or classes, uh, it's seeing that doing whatever is necessary. So for a class, it's a recompiling. I mean, you, you've recompiled the project, so it's restarting the, the, the boot application. Uh, just the spring context, actually, and uh, refreshing your browser with a signal. So the, the trick here is that uh, Spring Boot, when in development mode with DevTools, 
Spring Boot is using two, uh, DevTools is using two, uh, two different class loaders. One with all your dependencies, uh, so everything you've added in your pom.xml or your build.gradle, those tend to change not as much as everything else, which are your static resources and your code, which live in a different class order. So whenever something happens with your, with your code, for example, uh, boot detects that, throws away the, that class order, creates a new one, and restart the spring context. And uh, that's actually pretty fast because uh, uh, when you start your application, uh, starting the JVM, uh, warming up, and uh, loading all your, the classes from your dependencies, that takes a lot, a lot of time. And restarting the Spring context is actually pretty fast. So in that example, that's what, exactly what we're doing when we're changing the code. So, um, so you've seen two, the two main use cases of DevTools, really, is one, the first one is um, we've changed something that does not require the context restart. You don't need to restart the context if you change a template. Right? And the case where you change some code, so obviously we don't know the impact of changing that code. So we, we uh, drop the class loader, we, we create a new one, and we start the application. You can teach Spring Boot about that stuff. So uh, if you have a location uh, where, uh, not Java code, obviously you could do so, but that would probably be nasty. But if you have places in your app, resources that do not require the application to be restarted, or on the other hand, you have some specific area uh, when you change a, uh, some, some config file, for instance, and it requires the application to restart, you can teach a dev tool to actually change those behavior. You can also teach dev tools to watch files outside of your project. So for instance, if you have a client-side application using Angular or whatever, and you're serving, you're serving static resources from an external module, you can actually tell DevTools, go watch those files, and whenever you change code of your client, the browser will refresh. Or the application might restart if that's what you want. But DevTools has been there for since 1.3, right? And uh, now we're going to show you also new features uh, with DevTools and how it works. Right, um, so we have one, one tiny problem again. It's uh, the same thing, so I'm going to do that really, really quick. You've seen that at the keynote. I don't have an error page for that, so uh, I'm going to just create one. So it's yet another use case of DevTools is you add new stuff to your app, and uh, because you do, uh, we'll detect that. But this time you're creating that into the uh Templates. Templates folder. During the keynote, it was a static file in static. Now it's, a, it's actually a real finely template. So we'll, we'll see later how we can benefit from the fact it's a template. Um, so this app has one major issue. Uh, and the major issue it has is anybody can actually submit. One. Two, you can say you can provide any information you want there. Uh, and if you submit several talks, you have to repeat your information over and over again, which is bad, right? Mm -hmm. So we thought maybe we should find a way to add some kind of authentication to this app. Yeah. Um, and if you want to do that, usually you need to create, I mean, you have, you have to configure security, you have to create a database for that, uh, you have to register your users, and uh, uh, like, I forgot my password form, etc. You have to do all that. Or you can rely on a third party uh, application or service to do the authentic authentication. And one which is actually really nice is uh, OAuth2. So OAuth2 is about authorization, mm -hmm. but if you use it in a different way, you can also use it as a single sign-on service, and that's what we are actually doing right now. So the next demo is about to uh, enable single sign-on with OAuth, and we need to find a provider. And uh, well, since it's a conference, it's probably about code. Uh, GitHub might be a good option for that. You probably have already have a GitHub account. So this is a new feature in 1.4. Uh, to you, you'll see how you can configure uh, an OAuth 2 provider as a single sign-on uh, uh, in your boot application. So you're actually you actually need a new dependency. You know, you'll need here a security OAuth 2. Uh, then as a, um, I want to enable uh, OAuth, so. Single sign on for OAuth. Uh, if I do that, I'm basically telling Spring Boot, uh, please, uh, instead of the uh, instead of the traditional login form, just create a uh, login logout uh, interceptor for me. So because I'm doing this, I actually don't need the form login anymore. That can go away. 
And very important, now we want to make sure that whenever you access submit, uh, you have to log in, right? So currently submit is permit all. If I remove that, I'll go to the next rule, which means, okay, you need to, you need to be authenticated. So now we need to change our application so that uh, um, we actually ask GitHub for your, for your uh, rights and your credentials information. Mm. But if you've ever worked with OAuth 2, you know that you need some kind of other information, uh, information on the OAuth 2 providers, like URLs, uh, where, you should, where your OAuth client should, uh, sh who you, your, how you should talk to the, the server. So that's the configuration we're adding here. Uh, so the access token endpoints, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the really the four properties that you need um, to teach Spring Boot to which, to which URI it needs to contact uh, to do this authentication process. You'll find these four uh, properties, whatever the OAuth provider you're using. Uh, if you want to uh, use Twitter, for instance, or Google, or whatever OAuth resource provider available, the only thing that is going to change is those URI. And uh, if you go on the uh, developer area, for instance, the developer network for Twitter, you'll easily find the URI that you have to use. And we're actually almost there. We only need now uh, our client ID and uh, secret, uh, the, the, our client secret. So um, uh, really what's going to happen is uh, you're going to be redirected to uh, GitHub. And GitHub will say, there is this app that wants to know about you. Do you agree? And if you say yes, then you give us a right to actually see who you are. And we, we, are, we are sure, so basically that, that there is, there's an exchange. So GitHub gives us back basically uh, some information about you. And to get the client ID and client secret, we, we need to register our application with GitHub. And that's what we're uh, about to do uh, against the Spring One platform uh, org on GitHub. That's Oops. where the, the actual code lives, actually. The CFP-example application is the, so the right repository. You need to be admin to the organization to see this. So um, if you have a GitHub account, just go on to your own repository, the repository with your, user, your yeah. username. You'll find the settings page there, uh, host application. Then you regist register an application. You call that CFP example, for instance. Um, the home page is the thing, basically, where GitHub will call you. So when, when you log in your Spring Boot application with, um, on the four properties, it will use the first URI to contact GitHub and say, OK, I need to exchange with that guy, that person. And once the authentication process is complete, GitHub will basically redirect to the, the, to the URI that has been set there. So because I'm going to show you the client ID and client secret, which I'm not supposed to, uh, I'm going to say that it's redirect to this. And well, there's not much you can do with that, right? Um, so you need to provide some information about the application so that people actually know uh, why they should say okay. And once I've done that, I have the client ID and client secret. So I can go back here uh, where I had my security user. It's actually useless now and use client ID instead. So that's the last step, really, and client secret. So we've added the dependency, one annotation, uh, some configuration in our files. We've tweaked our security config. And now we'll see if, it, if everything works. So now when we access a protected page, we should uh, see the uh, OAuth authentication page uh, from GitHub. So I can still access the home page because there is nothing that prevents me to do that, right? Yeah. But if I click Submit now, I go back on GitHub. And GitHub tells me there is this CFP example that uh, wants to access your account. It wants to read public data only. So that's also something you can change. You can also specify scopes. So you could say, I want to be able to access that part of the user profile. And that will be, display that, that will be displayed down there. But right now, all I need is I need your name. That's all I need for my, for my purpose. I could have said I want to access your email. Uh, even even if, you, if you don't have a public email, you have a, an email in your account, but it's not visible to the user, then there is a special scope in GitHub to actually have, have access to that. So the, the, the question is, what do I have to, to add as, as dependencies to actually make that stuff work? And the answer is this. 
Yeah, part of the support is uh, inside Spring Security OAuth and part of the enable uh, OAuth or SSO is uh, in Spring Boot itself. So it's, it's, a, it's a standard protocol that you configure, right? So there's no Spring Security OAuth Google, Spring Security OAuth Twitter. There's no such, such thing because it's, it's simply the OAuth protocol and you're just configuring which service needs to be contacted. Right, so I'm going to say okay. And I'm auto automatically redirected to that. And you can see right there that actually I'm logged in now. OK. Um, there's a problem, though. I still, I still have the email and the name uh, um, fields there. We, we are going to remove that in soon. Uh, but one problem we have now is this. You're not allowed to go to the admin page anymore because right now, uh, before uh, we were admin when we had our previous uh, security configuration, and now we need to do something to actually decide who uh, is, can be an admin user, who can have that admin role in our application. So what we had before was plain Spring Security, so the, the default setup that Boot provides. And you've seen the um, security username, admin, security password, admin123. Uh, by default, um, that's in the doc, uh, by default, um, we will create a user with role admin. So that's what we got when we initially started. Uh, right now, uh, we have no roles. We just a plain, I'm just a plain GitHub user like, like you. Uh, so there is nothing that tells I'm actually an admin in this system. So we're going to change that. So whenever someone is authentication against uh, our application, we need to hook into that point and extract authorities uh, from those people to know if they're allowed to have that role or this role. And that's what we need to do right now. So first, we can uh, decide who can be an admin. And for now, we'll do that uh, statically with uh, just the, the list of our uh, GitHub handles. And uh, we can add something to our security configuration uh, that says uh, that fetches the login part of the uh, user information we fetch from GitHub, check if that uh, username is in our special list. And if it is, then uh, we are adding the admin role for that person. And that's what we actually do. So that, that callback is, is basically the OAuth provider that you've chosen is going to send us back some information, some unstructured uh, information. In the case of GitHub, uh, there is a login um, key that's actually your, your, your GitHub account, your GitHub ID. So we'll use that to see if um, it's contained within that list. And if that's the case, then we change the uh, user. Right? And if I do that, I'm an admin again. Right. Okay. But it's a bit, I mean, having that in a static list, it's a bit like not great in our application. We can definitely improve that. So uh, what, we not, what we want to show you now is how you can use Spring Boot to um, use to expose configuration properties for your app. So you s you've seen that at the keynote, uh, there was already some kind of infrastructure set up and this nice content assistance and blah, blah, blah. So you probably wonder now uh, what does it take to include that in your app from scratch. And that's what we're going to show you. So the first thing that you need to do really is to have a representation of those keys as, a, as an object structure. So I'm going to uh, create that for you right now, very quick. So as long as it's a, it looks like a Java bean and it's properly documented just like this, you're good to go. And you can even nest uh, several uh, inner classes to structure your, your namespace, and that's perfectly fine. So the, 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 the key here is if you want to have nested namespace, so you could have separate classes, of, of course, but if you want to gather a certain concept and have some kind of nested key, so foo dot something dot something, um, the key is to create a, uh, a, a pojo in a pojo, if you will. Uh, right now, you can see that it, this is de defined as static inner classes. The reason why uh, it's done that way is because the metadata will be picked up automatically. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. And the thing that matters is the name of the property. So if you have a get GitHub property, it means you'll get a GitHub namespace, security namespace in this case. Yeah. 
and we need a way to namespace this actual uh, those all those keys and for that we need the add configuration properties annotation and we say that let's say we want to namespace the whole class under CFP and so we'll get cfp.github, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, that class exposed two properties now, uh, cfp.github.token and cfp.security.admins. OK? So I want to use that. And um, this class, this, the only purpose of this class is to, bound, to bind the environment, to bind, bind some configuration keys from the environment to your class. Um, so um, you can actually in inject that as pretty much anything in Spring. So I'm going to show you that. Uh, let's see. I uh, can go right there and say, OK, I want to inject CFP properties. And I can say properties get security get admins and remove that thing. But IntelliJ complaints here tells me that's not a bean. I don't know about that stuff. And it's actually very right. Um, if you look here, um, it's not m a meta annotation. It's not a component. It's not going to be scanned by a component scan. We did that on very purpose, because we want you to um, make sure that this object does not become like a complex object with bean dependency, with, with complex business logic. The only purpose of that thing is to bind to the environment and to provide added values on top of the environment. So to, to really make that very clear, I'm going to, you can obviously add add component if you want. If that's what you want, you can do that and it will work. Uh, but I'm just going to show you another way to do it. I'm going to say, please process that class. And if I do that and I go back, um, I have a bin now. The other thing that we want to do is we want to remove that crap and use our CFP properties instead. So let's do this. So you can see that the value currently that we bind to is CFP underscore GitHub underscore token in uppercase. But it doesn't matter because with the boot relaxed binding, the, there are actual conventions to deal with it. So the underscores and, uh, and capital letters, they map easily to what we've actually done. So Spring Boot really binds to uh, system properties, environment variables, uh, command line switch, stuff that you put in application properties in YAML. So there's plenty of ways you can customize uh, your uh, configuration. And as Brian just said, um, we have some kind of relaxed way of binding those values. Because typically, OS environment variables requires you in certain OS, uh, the property needs to be in uppercase, and you can use dots. Uh, if you use dots on certain OS, it will just not work. Um, so we take care of that. But in, our, in your other file, I've seen that you've got that red banner on top. Right. Is that an error? So yeah, uh, the next step is actually how do we how do we have content assistance for that stuff, right? How do you how do you how do you get the list of keys? Um, well, IntelliJ warns us that uh, the annotation processor is not enabled. So let's add that and explain it. Should quickly explain you what that yeah. does. Because if we try, if we try right now to uh, uh, write those keys down in our configuration, we won't have the autocomplete support, and we actually need that to get this. So um, if I'm adding this, I'm basically adding a new. Uh, that's why it's optional right there. I'm adding a new component uh, that the compiler will detect. So the annotation processor is actually a complete standard. Um, and this implementation is basically going to inspect your code, the code in your project, find configuration properties object, and generate some metadata for it. So this will be quite transparent for you, basically. And once you've done that, um, if that works properly, let me check if the file, OK, it was generated. It was a cache issue. Then you get this, right? And you can see also that you get the documentation. So the documentation is actually extracted from here. You can also provide default values. You can provide metadata for values. So there are plenty of things you can do. Um, so this is really a good mechanism if you want to provide added value for your own configuration keys. So let's play with that a bit. And let's say I'm not an admin anymore, just to show you it works. So back to the application. 
Yeah, when you're trying to access the admin page, you're not allowed anymore to access that page. Because I'm not an admin, right, anymore. So um, one thing we want to do at this point is maybe to have an error page for the 403. Yeah, so we probably need to duplicate the other one, name it 403.html, right. or we could have something more clever. So we could, be, we could be more smart about it. We have a page for 404. Uh, we want a page for 403. And for our own purpose, a single page would work. So what you can do with Spring Boot now is you can just name that 4xx. And if you do this, we will recognize the pattern and we will serve, serve it. Yeah. So if you have a 404 on top, we'll take the 404 on top. But if there is no client-side error page defined, then we will take the default if there's one. But it's still called uh, not found, so we still have a problem. Yes. So yeah, it's still, it's still wrong. So let's um, show you why it's a template and why it's actually interesting for your um, use case. So I'm going to use a time leaf here, and I'm going to say, oops, plus error. Yeah, yeah, there is a problem with the quotes and single, single quotes. Oh, yeah. good point. And the error, we're actually given a, an error object uh, by, the, by boot when an error occurs. So you can use that object into your template to do whatever you need. And in our case, we are using that to, in the title to, uh, to customize the page. Uh, so if you look at the doc, you'll see that the uh, Spring Boot will, uh, will have an error attributes pojo uh, that it's going to give you out of the box. You can customize that. So you'll get the error, you'll get the status code, you'll get the stack trace if there's one, you'll get the timestamp. Uh, I think there's a few more I can't remember, but it's in the doc. Um, so all these, of course, you can use that in your own template. Okay, now we have the authentication, but we still wanted to use that for the submit page, right? right. You, you, you're authenticated, but you kind of need to still uh, fill in the form with your email and your name, etc., where we could easily derive that from your, uh, from your user information we've got already. So the next step really is to actually use the information we get from GitHub, or what, the, the OAuth provider really, and link that to your submission. So there's quite a lot of code. So like Brian explained, we have this uh, nice commit. I'm going to not do live coding for this one. Sorry. Mm -hmm. What we've done with the, that commit, we've uh, added a, um, a user uh, domain object to persist in our database. Uh, that user holds all the information about our users when you're logged in. Uh, we've also tweaked the template to remove the email, uh, the email part of the form, and we've also changed a bit the, the header so you can get your, your picture from GitHub when, you, when you're logged in. Uh, so with all that, you have a, a much better experience when you're logged in. You don't need to fill in the whole information. You, you got your, your picture on top. And, uh, and if you submit several things, uh, they're all linked to the same person, you. And you can see that into the, the actual database. We've got a, a, new, uh, a new table user. Um, you should know that we've also done something uh, in our security configuration. When someone logs in for the first time, we're actually creating the, the user in, uh, in the database so that we're sure that the user is persisted uh, before it can, the person can create a new, yeah. a new submission. So let's, let's quickly show that. Um, first of all, what we've, what we've added is this principal extractor. Yeah. So basically what we want to do is we want to teach Spring Security what the object representing the uh, authenticated, authenticated user is. So for that, we, we implement that interface. Again, we get some information from the OAuth provider. Uh, we use our service to ask GitHub, please give me more information about that user. Because uh, that uh, thing is actu actually knows about the OAuth context, if there is scope attached to, uh, if there is scope attached to the uh, OAuth authentication process, you'll be able to access those information. So the, so the call that you're going to make to GitHub will, will match the scope that you've, you've asked. As you've seen, I uh, just asked for the public scope, so it really doesn't change, doesn't make any difference. But this thing is actually pretty much transparent for you. Yeah. And if you do that, instead of getting the authentication principle uh, all over the place in your application and you just have the username information from there, 
uh, you can actually customize the, the type you'll get when you inject that, uh, when you inject that over your application. And then you can add more information. And in our, in our case, we've added many information in, into that user uh, object, the, the URL uh, and, uh, of the picture, anything, anything you like. Uh, and that's the actual thing you can inject here in the controller. Uh, we've uh, annotated our an, uh, controller argument with the add authentication principle, and we've added the, the type directly that we want. And that's the type we, we've uh, configured in our authentication instructor. So you can get the user, your custom user object, wherever you want into the application, meaning the controller, but even in templates. Right. If so you show the, uh, the time leaf templates in yes. the layout, if you look at the layout where we, you have the, the name in the, the little picture uh, on top, then we've, uh, here we're, we're using a time leaf extension, the, the Spring Security extension, so you can directly use the authentication principle uh, into your templates to get the GitHub username or uh, the URL of the profile, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you, you'd like to. Okay, so you'd like to see the that part again, where we get the the, the, the information from the client. So the information we got from the GitHub API when we uh, request and a request to the user endpoint of GitHub, that sends back all the information about our user, the login, and other things. And we are creating from there, extracting the extracting the login, and then we're creating from there uh, our own user. Uh, object, and uh, we are uh, adding information to that user and persisting it into the database. So, if if you if you log in for the first time, what's what what going to what's going to happen is we are going to actually create a user in the system in the database uh, uh, to associate basically your submission to that user, and if you log in maybe ten hours later, your user will still be in the system, so we'll just use that and return that as the principal. You can change that if you're using Twitter or Google as a no-auth provider. You can tweak the keys, extract more information, use your own user object, and do as much as you want. So uh, in, in our app, we only have one authentication mechanism. But we could perfectly have two buttons, one for GitHub, one for Twitter. And depending on which one has been invoked, basically have a different callback and do different things. OK. Um, so right. now our application is pretty complete, but I think we still have a problem with the rate limiting because we're actually making a lot of requests to GitHub. We're making requests when people authenticate. We're making requests when we are getting the, the latest commits for a Spring Framework and Spring Boot. Uh, and that tends to make a lot of requests. Right now, we told you we've got a, a token, uh, an authentication token to, uh, to make requests to the GitHub API and not be uh, forbidden to do so. When, we, uh, when the rate limiting is, uh, is uh, we explode that rate limiting. Uh, so right now, Stefan is showing um, a way to, he, he's uh, requesting the, the GitHub API and extracting the rate limiting information. So we know that we have uh, 4,900 yeah. 4, uh, remaining requests. And uh, as long as we make, we refresh the, when we refresh the page, uh, you can see that the, that number of requests is slowly, slowly but surely, uh, uh, is less and less. So you, re you remember that we did this caching thing uh, at the keynote to show you how you can enable caching. So I'm, I'm not going to, to code that right now to uh, s save some time for the rest of the demo. So I'm just going to check out that and just show you a different way of doing it. So in, in, in this app, uh, what I've decided to use was not to use caffeine, just to show you a different one. I'm going uh, ehcache, ehcache 3, and I'm using jcache, the jcache API, so the JSR 107 spec. And uh, just to show you the kind of uh, experience you get, um, this is the kind of thing you could do. Uh, it's, it's a pattern that you'll find in boot a lot. Uh, so whenever you want to customize something, uh, we will provide customizer callback API for that. So if you, the same thing as the principal extractor, really. Uh, if you implement a bin of principal extractor, we'll call you and you'll get a chance to uh, uh, return a different user. In this case, uh, you implement a bin of type jcache manager customizer, 
and before the application starts servicing requests, we will give you the cache manager and you'll get a chance to tune it any way you like. So in this case, I'm creating three uh, caches and I'm using the GSI API to basically say, I want to enable statistics, I want to, um, this one to expire, the entries expire after 10 minutes, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we've created three cache names, one for the commits, the latest commits, one for the latest polish commit because we have uh, that sign saying we've well, when the last, last polish commit were, happened on, on our projects and as well another cache name for uh, the user information we're yep. extracting. So we, we are basically using that, that method uh, when you authenticate to retrieve more information about you. Right, so if I do this, well, as you would expect, it works, blah, blah, blah. Next up is uh, we want to we want to we've been developing this app we've been changing many things but I think maybe it's about time that we have some kind of better management of the schema so um, we haven't seen so much about the database so far it's an H2 database in memory uh, we don't care about the schema it's created automatically by Hibernate we don't know what kind of uh, what kind of DDL uh, Hibernate is using. Um, but we would like to have more control over the schema and better yet if we want to uh, have a persistent database instead with some data and we want to change the schema because we want to add more features to more data. Uh, we want an easy way to actually upgrade that schema. Okay? Uh, what we want basically is whenever we deploy a new version of our application, we want the schema to update automatically. So the first thing we need to do really is to use uh, a schema manager and there's actually a couple of ones you can use. Uh, there's Liquibase and Flyway. So uh, we're going to use Flyway uh, for this one. So I'm adding the dependency. As you'll find with boot, uh, that's pretty much something that's uh, consistent. Whenever you add more dependencies, boot will detect them and do something by default for you. So um, the way it works with Flyway is you need to create a directory, a directory structure, sorry, called DB migration. So uh, directory maybe. Yeah, and that folder should uh, hold all the SQL scripts that are that are that should be used to uh, create your database and uh, to uh, adapt it and modify it uh, for the newest versions whenever you decide you need to change something in your database. So as long as you're respecting the, the conventions with the version underscore underscore the name of the, the schema you're trying to, to apply that SQL, as long as you uh, adopt that, that convention, you're good to go. So here for the first version of our database, we, we're deciding to create our tables with the submissions and our users. But still, since we're doing that, we don't need, to, we don't need uh, Hibernate to do that for us anymore. Right. So we kind of need to disable that. So we're going to tell Hibernate, yeah, don't My hello, hello. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, by the way, that's a good example of auto, uh, auto completion for values. You can see the thing on the right. You're wondering right now, can I do that for my own keys? Yes, you can do that. And it's actually very easy. Um, and if you have an enum, so if you expose an enum type, uh, you'll get that auto completion out of the box and will fetch, well, we don't. The good ID developers do that for us. They will fetch the Java doc on the enum and will display that right there. So I'm going to say none. And let's see what happens if I restart the app. That's not very funny at this point because we're still using an in-memory database, right? So uh, don't really care just to prove that uh, our application still works. Yeah, but still, since we're using Flyway, we want to make sure that one, the, the, the tables are created properly in our database. Uh, and that our database is still working. So when we create a submission, it still works. When we take a look at the actual H2 console uh, in, for our in-memory database, we can see that not only we have our submission and user tables, we also have a new uh, schema version uh, table uh, that lists all the, the actual scripts that are applied against your database whenever a migration occurs. And we can also get that information from a, a separate endpoint that, are, that is provided by Spring Boot, where you can see in a nice JSON format the, all the migrations that are applied to your database. So instead of going to your table and seeing what migrations have been applied, you can check that information directly 
with the with that endpoint. Um, if you happen to prefer Liquibase, uh, you'll get exactly the same features. So you have an ad uh, well, it's admin because we redi 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 redirect it, but you'll have a Liquibase endpoint that gives Liquibase information about your schema. So uh, that's very convenient, but let's maybe switch to a real database. So uh, what we want to show you is how you can easily uh, change the environment locally and use ID settings, ID uh, features to do so. So one thing I want to do now is I want to connect to my local MySQL database. So I have it, I have it here, and if you look, I have a CFP, um, I have a CFP uh, database, and there is actually no tables in there. Okay, so let's switch to um, MySQL. So what does it take to switch from H2 to MySQL and make that configurable? The first thing is we want to create a file, a profile, and that's very small, and call that local. Okay, so application-local is going to be loaded if the local profile is active. It's some kind of convention in boot. And um, I'm going to say, you all know my password now, but it only replies to localhost. Huh? So uh, this is the settings that you have to do. Um, you may notice that you're not specifying the driver. You don't have to. There's plenty of samples on the internet explaining how you can connect Spring Boot to a database. And 99% of them have the driver. Don't do that, because we actually extract the driver for you uh, from the URI. So it's an information you don't have to provide. But you still need to provide the actual driver somewhere, right. because we can't do that for you, for you. So you need to go back to your palm and add that as a dependency properly. Uh, so MySQL, right. So and now that we that. have the driver, we have the local configuration, we still need to trigger that actual local profile in our application. So the next step, if you want to keep both environments, so you want to keep the uh, H2 in memory database and do whatever you want and lose the data every time you, rest you restart the app, or you want to connect to a physical database, then the good way to do that in the ID is actually to have two run configuration for that. There's the same feature in SCS. So I'm going to clone the run config. I'm going to call that whatever, you could call that MySQL, whatever you want. And right here, I'm going to say, I want to enable the local profile. So the only, dif the only difference between the two is that um, one is enabling the local profile, so it will read that thing, and the other one won't. So if I'm starting the app now with the local profile, and I refresh right here, I'll have my tables created for me. Okay. So that's all, all, the, all that it takes to connect to a different database. You just provide those three properties. Uh, because you do so, you're actually telling Spring Boot, OK, there is H2 there. So you could create an H2 database in memory. But I'm telling you, this is where the database is located for my app. So you have, you're basically having an opinion in configuration. We will detect that, and we will use that information to create a data source for you. Yeah. So we can even try to create a few uh, submissions within our application. Yes, just to prove it works. OK, from here big to big. So it didn't take that long for us to uh, change the authentication mechanism, rely on OAuth, uh, handle our database, change a few things in our application. Uh, that's already a lot of features. Uh, in just a few minutes. And now we're going to see how we can have even more fun uh, by changing our database while the application is in production holding data, or holding data. And that's the actual thing you want to do when you're using something like Fly Flyway. So let's see that you've done a first release of this app. And you have some data in production with all, all kinds of paper. And your customer is, uh, is telling you, well, um, this form is nice, but we really need a separate section so that the, the, the speaker um, could add notes to the CFP. So some information about uh, why am I submitting that talk, uh, what I'm going to do, some basically information that needs to be exchanged between the CFP and the speaker. So um, it's very convenient now that we have um, Flyway is we are going to add a note uh, attribute to our submission table. And for that, I'm going to, again, uh, do that thing. Yeah, so in that commit, we are uh, adding 
a new uh, SQL script, a new migration script. We are adding a new field in our uh, submission form. Uh, we are adding a new field as well in the entry, domain entry itself. And as you can see, we've got a new entry in our form, uh, and uh, we can create a new entry with those nodes. Like this. So now that we've got that, we should have right. something different in our database. Yes. So uh, also something that you may have noticed is the application was running, right? So the application was running. I did the checkout of this new commit that had more features. It's like I would have coded myself. Like it would have probably taken an hour or 30 minutes to do so just to add all the fields and everything. I, and I didn't have to restart, right? And bam, here's my app updated for me with the database updated for me. Yes? Um, so the question is, should you write it? Should you write that script yourself, or is there some tool you you can use to generate it for you? I'm probably. I think it, I don't know if there is an, there's probably an app that does that. But I'm more in the camp of um, if you're using that stuff, you probably want to make to maintain the script and yeah. you want to make sure what happens, and you may also want to tune also. Um, the uh, database according to what you're using. There might be some things in MySQL. Obviously, there's not a lot of data here. But in a real production application, you may want to use some tricks of the database, something that are not standard. And that's where generation tools usually don't provide you that kind of feature. And here, we're just adding a new column in the database. But when you use th those tools, usually, you, um, you rename a column. You I need to tweak something in, a, in existing values, like set a, set the default values for, for so many entries, etc. So you're not just changing the schema. Usually, you're also doing something very specific to your own domain to change things in uh, for all the existing data. So that's where maybe a tool could do things for you, but certainly not everything. So maybe just extracting if you've got something already in a database somewhere uh, with the, the actual type. Maybe you can just ex extract the create table statement. But for uh, other things, it's probably more complex. You probably want to do that yourself. So uh, what's in this commit? Yeah, go ahead. Did you get that? Didn't. I didn't get the question. Sorry, can you repeat? It's not. It's it's GPA right now running. Okay. So if you look, if you look at the, I'm not really answering your question, but uh, we're using GPA. We're using Hibernate. So uh, what we've done is we we told Hibernate, please don't generate the schema, right? But you could say, please do so and please log it. Then you could see in the logs what Hibernate generated and take that as a base. That's actually what I did because I'm lazy. So I just did that. I copy paste for the first version, and once you have the schema running, then you can okay fine tune. Yeah. Can you speak louder, please? Because. No. Um, so the question is, um, I have all those databases, all those different databases, and they may have specific things that they support or do not support. Is there a way to have some, of some generic way of ending that? That's the question, right? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, however, what you have with uh, Flyway is you can have database-specific scripts. So you have this platform uh, thing that you can use to fine-tune according to the actual database type.
That's what we've done, right? Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what we've done in this app. We let. <coughs> right, right. But on the other hand, if you support multiple databases with advanced schema structure, that's the price to pay, I think. Yeah, that, that's actually what we did for the Spring.io website. We created the, the, the tables with the JPA, etc. when we started building the application. And now that it's running in production, we have, we're using Flyway to uh, update the schema and update the, the data as well uh, in production when we are updating the application, which is uh, fairly often. So once you've got a lot of data in your, in your database and you're not considering changing the, the database, then uh, Flyway can be pretty useful in those, in those cases. Um, so we still have two minutes um, just to recap what we've done, right? Um, so we, ha we had an app. We used DevTools to modify this app. We integrated OAuth and Signal Sign-On. We've added caching. We've added database management. You can see now that our schema is at version 1.1. .1. Uh, so whenever you need to do a change now, you, are, you have all the infrastructure to do so. And we've also uh, configured security in such a way that the information we get from GitHub is linked to a user table that we have in our system. Um, so um, I think that's it. Uh, we have one minute left, so probably a bit too late for questions, I'm afraid. Um, but we are right here if you want. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>